been hard to talk to your dad about everything. Losing your mom, then losing the colony right after. It's too much to take. Neither of you know what to say. Engineering is crammed with families and what belongings they salvaged from destroying their quarters. You spend time in your crowded temporary lodging classroom or spend time uh, helping the dolls try to fix things. I think rebuilding makes the most sense at this point. The first month of quiet passes, each day plotting one after another. You still have trouble sleeping in the classroom barracks, but there's nowhere else to go. Every day you wake with the others and try to make the best of it. Grief and anger comes in waves, not just for you, but for everyone. Some days are better than others. You're assigned to help rebuild the walls. The first part of the month is spent just dragging away the wreckage, sorting it into salvage or recycling. By the time that's done, crews dissembling parts of the stratosphere have been delivered enough salvage that you can begin working patching up the walls. A sense of urgency permeates the crew. After everything, people need to feel safe. This is on work crew with you, something he does begrudgingly. Walls didn't help the first time, he grumbles whenever anyone asks for his opinion. You should just tear them all down, down and live like the animals do. If someone planted a bunch of buildings on my land, I'd be pissed off too. Uh, no, walls helped a little. We're gonna work hard. By the end of the month, you made notable progress. There are priorities and not a lot of construction material. When last year's mushwood harvest is done drying out, you'll be able to do more. Even if it is rice and it didn't help the first time, it's better than nothing. The sun's finally dawn again on your birthday. You wake early and climb to the top of engineering to watch the first sun's watery rays break the horizon as the wormhole recedes across the sky. Dawn should represent hope after a long period of darkness, but this light only reveals the full extent of the damage to the colony. You've been having trouble sleeping, like most people. It's hard to find rest crammed into the classroom with all the other kids and families. Every time you close your eyes, you see... You shake your head to clear the memories. You pull a blanket more tightly around your shoulders. Not your blanket. That one's gone. As you stare out, the sun rises on the horizon, meager and sickly. Hey, kiddo, you hear when your dad comes and sits down beside you. I was looking for you. Nice view, huh? At least we got a rooftop patio out of the deal. He laughs a little at his own joke, and then just sort of trails off with a sigh afterward. He puts his arm around you, your shoulders, and sits in silence for a while. Watching the sunrise pick out all the broken glass fluttering the fields, glimmering like a field of stars. Neither of you know what to say. It's clear your dad feels like he has to give you a pep talk, but there's an oppressive nature to the silence that makes it feel impossible for either of you to start. Eventually, he just sighs his shoulders into a slump. I know things seem pretty bad right now, he says, squinting into the sunrise. It sounds like it's taking all of his effort not to cry. But it will get better. It has to, right? You're not so sure. At least your mom wasn't here to see this, he mutters. That's the silver lining, I guess. You watch the sunrise together for a few more minutes. After a bit, your dad musters up a brave smile and pulls out a little box tied with a piece of gardening twine. Happy birthday, my little rutabaga, he says. You know what it is before you open your it. Your old medallion, the one your dad made, with the sun on it to represent Earth. It was broken during the attack, and all the chaos you didn't even notice, but your dad did. He made you a new one. It's just like you remembered. Similar design, with the wormhole this time to represent Vertuma. You thank him and squint onto the swirling wormhole that's so visible, barely visible in the brightening sky. It's so massive and awe-inspiring this time of year. It always seems to be herald disaster. You're happy to watch it fade away into the daylight. Dad slaps you on the back. What a birthday, huh? Here's hoping they all get better from here. You both head uh, downstairs to the wreckage of the canteen, where they put up temporary roofing with whatever tarps and scraps could be found. The colony nanopredators the few that still run, have been working day and night to replace the necessities of life, but larger construction projects are still going to take time. Aunt Anne has coaxed the kitchen nanoprinters into making soy gruel and press bars. Life-sustaining, but depressing. You and the other colonists eat your breakfast in stony silence as you mentally prepare for the day. Chief Administrator Seek has taken over interim governor until the council can elect someone new. Last week, they held a mass funeral for everyone who died. There's talk of turning the stratospheric destroyed front half into a memorial shrine after everything that's useful has been salvaged. There's still much to do.
we will continue to help rebuild. At this point, need to rebuild as fast as possible. You are assigned to help out in geoponics. The agriculturists have been hard at work trying to salvage what they can of the ruined fields and destroyed greenhouses. But there's still a lot of work to be done. Your dad has taken over as chief cultivator, succeeding where your mom was already difficult for him. And now there's this. He's never been the kind of guy to hide from hard work, but he's been pretty distant lately. Kyle's working in geoponics too, of course. He smiles when he sees you. Hey, Selene. There's a lot of stuff to do. What do you want to work on? Let's see. Repair the greenhouses. Work the fields. Rebuild the animal pens. I'm going to feel like the greenhouses will probably be the best things to focus on first. The geodesic domes, miraculous prefab molecular modular structures your parents brought from Earth, are in shambles. Most of the glass and metal is beyond repair, designed for your recycler. You and Cal help clear away the debris, and when that's done, you help drape tarps over what's still standing, that the drifting spark snow doesn't pile up inside and infect Soil City. Anything that can't survive outside a climate-controlled greenhouse needs to be harvested and set to the kitchens, so that can be preserved. Canning, jarring, dehydration, ancient techniques you've learned about in school but didn't think you have to put in practice so soon. Tammy visits almost every day. She says this to pick up the day's harvest, but you know, it's just so she can visit Cal. Everyone is worried that this will be the final nail in the coffin for your food supply after famine last year. You try not to think about it too hard, instead focusing on just doing what you can to help rebuild. You're eating in the mess tents when you hear something rumbling. Your bull and cutlery start rattling. People look around in alarm. Could it be another attack so soon? You begin to hear shouting from outside. Someone runs into the tent. There's something falling from the sky! You shout. It's on fire! You join the crowd of people leaving your temporary structures to gather in the colony square. People are squinting up into the milky quiet sky, like pointing and gesturing wildly. It's impossible to miss the thing hurling towards you from the space. Like a great big ball of fire coming straight for you. Is this it? Is this the end? After all you've been through, a meteor is going to land in the middle of your already ruined colony and kill you all? Mars grabs your shoulder. It's another ship! She exclaims. Look, look, it's another spaceship from Earth! Excitement ripples through the crowd. Could it be? You stare up, unbelieving at the rapidly approaching ship. The flames of its entry into the atmospheric dissipate, but soon a thick column of greasy black smoke trails behind it. Soon you can hear the whistle of it ripping through the atmospheric etchmer at terminal velocity. It's coming right at us. That's not a control to set. Whoa. That's not a controlled descent. It's an enormous ship, coming at you way too fast. The ship's reverse thrusters fire, trying to slow it down so it doesn't smash into a billion pieces when it hits the planet. Everyone scatters to take cover. You crouch behind some of your rocks, throw your arms up over your head, and squeeze your eyes shut, and probably hope for the best. You hear the massive spaceship touch ground and geoponics plowing through the fields and grinding over what was left of the greenhouses. You're thrown to the ground from the force of the impact as shrapnel and rocks zing past your head. It grinds along like some roaring monster, cutting a great scar through the colony and kicking up an enormous cloud of dust. Yep, geopotics just gets everything. Finally, the ship comes creaking to a shuddering halt. You and the other colonists carefully crawl out of your hiding places, coughing and rubbing your eyes. The new ship is half buried and obscured by dust. You can tell it's from Earth. You squint and make out the stenciled letters. Heliopause. Catch opens inside and silhouettes begin to emerge. Silhouettes with guns. Soldiers march out of the dust and quickly surround all of the remaining colonists. More soldiers form two parallel lines from the ship to the square. Their guns and parade rest. And a lone figure strides down the center towards you. Greetings, fugitives of Earth, the man says, spreading his hands wide. A dismayed murmur ripples through the crowd. The adults exchange significant looks. 
Peace engineer instance tries to slip out of the crowd, but she's stopped by a line of soldiers. The man smiles as he has a broad, easygoing smile that doesn't match the threatening aura of the soldiers, nor the smoking ruin the ship behind him. I am Commander Loom, he says proudly. As captain of the Heliopause, I have come to render aid and bring you to justice. Seek steps forward out of the crowd. You're not the commander of the Heliopause, they say firmly. Governor Etikot was expecting Commander Mor Morikawa. Everyone is surprised. Etikot had been in communication with the ship? For how long? I am the captain of the Heliopause, Lum repeats stubbornly, then adds, According to the chain of command, we uh, sustained significant loss of personnel when we went through the wormhole. You can't help but notice many of the soldiers exchanged looks this time. I wonder how many people had to die before Loom became commander. As commanding officer, Loom continues, I declare that comedy began be under our protection. As such, you are all now subject to the laws of Earth. Sieg bows. Now, now, they stammer. There's no need for dramatics. We're a diminished colony, and as you can see, Governor Etiquette died in the most recent attack. Fluorescent passed away a few months ago. Even technician Laetatius is gone. You see, we're quite leaderless. Wait, your mom? What would have these Earth cops have wanted from your mom? You notice Chief Engineer Instance is being held with her arms behind your back. She glowers at Lum uh, with unbridled hatred. Lum turns to the assembled colonists. Well, why don't we fix that, he declares. Say hello to your new governor. You feel food grass and shock and outrage, and Lum raises his hand beside you. Let's not pretend you don't need our help, he says. We could simply arrest you instead, but there's no need to demoralize your little colony further. Judging from the number of guns on display, you don't think you have a choice in this. No one knows how to react. A new governor from Earth? Nearly a hundred new colonists? Most of them trained soldiers? What does this mean for the colony? The crowd disperses slowly, and the council members follow Loom back to the healer pause, presumably to talk about the future of the colony. Yeah, hope. You track down your friends. So, what do you think about these new people, Mars asks? We can go with, I don't want to share this planet, though. I don't mind sharing, Chammy times in. They might be from Earth, but they're still human. They're probably just scared, like when we were like we were when we came through the wormhole. The entire colony, now twice as many of you, says to work on salvaging the wreckage from the heliopause, tearing it down and combining it with the stratospheric's remaining engine section. Spirits are high, though these new colonists from heliopause aren't like people you've ever met before. With their uniforms and weapons, they're more like an invading force than a rescue. You aren't sure what this means for the colony, or for your future. As the dust settles, you rebuild your colony around the new ship, the Heliopause. The new arrivals, soldiers many, are aloof at first. Many see you as fugitives. Together, you build new walls, living quarters, greenhouses, and a massive bunker garrison. The Stratos Engineering Wing is the only remainder of the old colony. The Heliopause has brought enough rations for another five years, as well as rich seed bank and working hydroponics. Finally, an end to the slow starvation you felt for years. You also have more guns and explosives than you have ever seen in your life. Even the ship has guns. A full stomach, a roof over your heads, and the promise of safety convinces most Strato colonists to accept the Helios. In turn, the Helios decide that you criminals pose little threat. The grudging peace is brokered between the crew two groups. They decide they aren't so different, really. There are even Helio children born among the stars, just like you. After a month of hard work, you and your dad move into your new quarters, and you have your own bedroom for the first time in your life. You place a picture of your mother on the shelves beside your bed. You step out into your very own balcony to watch the new colony, its grounds bustling with so many strangers and strange new ideas. You feel something rising in your chest that you haven't felt in time. Hope? Excitement? What will the new day bring? You better get out there and find out now. We can just rush out there and greet the day. <laughs> Even though it hurts, you find yourself wandering over geoponics. It feels not good to be here. 
in the place your mom loved and ultimately gave her life to, but not not good either. It feels like when you have a bruise and you can't stop yourself from pushing on it because the pain reminds you the injury is real. Like your mom dying is this huge invisible wound and poking at you forces you to feel something instead of just being numb. Your dad is taking time off work. Your parents work double and triple shifts during the growing season this year and now that's over, they just feel so cruel. When people work hard, they should be able to look back on what they did and feel proud. Instead, there's just this huge gap where your mom should be. You find your dad sitting in your mom's personal garden. It's miraculously starting to grow again, despite being trampled flat during the last attack. And neglected during the famine before that. Still, various fruit flowers are starting to sprout, as well as prettier ones like dandelions. Your dad looks up and musters a smile. He pats the bench beside him. You false start a few times. It's almost impossible to think of something to say when there's a magnitude of grief between you. He gives you time. When it's obvious you want to talk, but don't know what to say, he takes your hand and does two larger ones. Did I ever tell you about how your mom and I started dating? You shake your head. You knew they grew up together in the first colony on Earth, but nothing about their relationship. He smiles and looks at the garden as he remembers. I always thought she was too cool for me, he says quietly. There were, well, people didn't like us much on Earth, so she was always kind of a bruiser, always ready to pop off even when she was your age. She and Rhett were the same back then. I always thought they were going to end up together. Then your mom got injured when the first colony was attacked. I was working part-time in the clinic, and I guess that's when she realized I liked her. We had to apply to get on the stratospheric. We'd only been seeing each other for a few weeks, so I was surprised when she said that we should apply as a couple. They wanted all different types of family and groups. Single people, couples who could have kids, or opponent, trads, quads. But we all had to be young, and there weren't many teenagers willing to commit to being, you know, a mated pair. It upped our chances being picked. He laughed and scrubs his face with his hands. She wanted to get off that planet more than anything. I don't think she realized she'd fallen in love with me until we were already in space. Lucky for me, right? Your dad shakes his head fondly. There aren't many people like your mom, kiddo. You nod, surprised to feel a tear trickle down your cheek. Just so much you didn't know about her and what she was like. More than just being your mom, it's really hitting you that she was a person before you knew her. And now you'll never know her like that. There's a past you'll never fully know. Just like there's a future she never will. Your dad puts his arm around your shoulders and you sit like that for a long, long while. What do you got, dad? Bring it on. Like every pollen season, your dad gets the shimmer. The pollen is bad this year. Thick, heavy clouds of pink. Even your eyes are a little itchy, and your dad's not the only colonist uh, spending the week in bed. You hear other people sneezing as you walk through the quarters, uh, bringing him hot trippet soup. Thanks, kiddo, your dad rests. At least he's sitting up in bed now. Your mom never got sick, not ever, your dad reminisces. I'm not sure she missed a day of work from the day we landed until the day she... He stops and sighs. I miss your mom. I wish Instance would find a cure already, he grumbles, his hand shaking as he lifts his spoon. Three years, and all she can suggest is bed rest and fluids. What good is all her researching if I can't fix my headache? Your dad must be feeling really sick. He never complains about this stuff. You check his temperature with your hollow palm, then dim the lights and bring him a cold pack for his forehead. He has a crust of glittery pink gunk around his lips, looking cracked and gross. You wipe it away. The glitter is just everywhere on him, like it's coming right out of his pores. He looks iridescent in the murky light flickering through the pollen outside. Hey, do you mind opening the window a little for some fresh air? It smells like a sick person in here, he crumbles, pushing away his soup rolling over the bed. Alright, we'll open the window. Let more pollen in. Well, it's already everywhere, you figure. It's good to get some air circulation in here. You're pretty sure you learned about the miasma theory in class. Your dad, his eyes already closed, breathes in deeply and falls asleep with a smile on his lips. The worst of the pollen fog subsides in a few days and your dad starts to look a little better. He gets back to work, which is good because there's a lot to do in order to rebuild the colony and get Heliopause's hydroponics up and running. He's still sweeping glittering dust out of the quarters weeks later. This stuff gets everywhere. The colony is full of new people. 
Everywhere you look, you see a stranger. It's disorienting. After glowing, growing up in a cloud of spaceship, you'll never expect to meet any other humans that weren't made here on Vertuma. You bump straight into one of these new people while you're jogging through the colony. Oof, he laughs and holds you steady, brushing the imaginary dust off you and giving you a wide fang smile. Hey, it's one of the kids from the Helio Pods. You think his name is Rex. Let's just go with the first one. Smooth, Selene. Real smooth. He cocks his head at you, smiling. Hi, he says gently. My name is Rex. You managed to get out of the... <laughs> Hello? You aren't quite sure why he's having such an effect on your ability to speak or even think. He doesn't mind. You notice he's wiggling his dog ears. They can really move independently. Rex puts his hand against his cheek, looking cute and lost. Ah, uh, hey, since I'm new here, do you think you could help me find the construction yard? I thought I might apply for a job there. His eyes widen as he winks suggestively and he grins, wiggling his tail and lolling his tongue out like a dog. So adorable. I might just take you up on that, he says. You tell him everything is a bit changed since Heliopods landed, but you think the construction yard is still near Caban. He thanks you for the directions. You've seen Nami Nami around since the Heliopods landed. They're around your age and barely a meter and a half tall, only coming up to your shoulder. You've never seen anyone dress as strangely as they do. Hi. Their voice is high-pitched and quick. I'm Nami Nami, short for nomination. So, Nami Nami. They do a little twirl and bow. You introduce yourself and... Well, Nami Nami begins. Kind of a bit of everything. I like designing outfits, reading manga, and learning about dinosaurs, and cool xenophaga, and robots, and aliens, and oh, and watching anime and playing Laser Fable, of course. Mostly lately, I play Laser Fable. It's so fun to play it outside in the great endless doors. Nami Nami dances circle, waving their arms and gesturing at your surroundings. Uh, calm down. Nah. Challenge them to game Laser Fable. Light laser. Laser Fable's fine. You're on! Nami Nami helps you install it in your hollow palm and explains the rule. Laser Fable is an augmented reality game where you bounce hologram lasers off real objects nearby. It's speed based, so you're running around and bumping into each other, and there's extended house rules about when it's legal to block each other's lasers. Right on, friendo! Nami gives you a high five, and then with a couple flicks of, on their gauntlet, gives you kudos for winning. They explain that this is how they always play Laser Fable with the kids from Heliosphere. Except they mostly don't want to play anymore. They said they're too old for it, they just want to be soldiers now. Except Rex, he's still cool. It's so, so cool you guys have people who aren't boys or girls too. Nami says, twisting a long piece of their hair around the finger. My own dad told me that sometimes people on older genetic stands do stuff like that. And your ship and I left Earth before us, so maybe it was even worse then. They give you a bright smile. They were worried for nothing, everyone's so nice here. And back to Rex. Rex haven't, hasn't gotten used to life on the surface yet. You remember your first year. Virtuma seems so enormous, so full of dangers and mysteries. Well, it still does, but the shock eventually wore off. Rex still has that slightly bewildered look on his face every time he walks outside, and the sunlight hits his face. It's so bright and warm. Actually, I'm working on something right now, Rex says, producing a hollow projector. It looks so familiar. Wait, the hollow projector you used to watch vids on the crush. It's been broken ever since the crush was destroyed. I was hoping you could help me fix this up. I want to have it outdoor movie nights. Help Rex bring the hot structure back to life. Can you help him make an outdoor theater for it? Complete with overhead lights and comfortable piles to sit upon your bedding. And Anne provides snacks. Rex looks at it with pride. We just have to figure out what to play for opening night. And hugs. Aw, yeah! Rex exclaims, wrapping you in a strong bear hug. He even lifts you off the ground a little. It's a good hug, the kind that makes you instantly just more relaxed. You know what my hammock needs? An automatic sack delivery system for when my hands are busy. I was thinking, if I hang a barrel of cookies up here, he continues pointing an narwhal tree nearby. I could use ramps and pulleys to bring the cookies over here, he gestures his hammock, and they could just roll right into my mouth. It's a bold plan. It involves a lot of twisty, turning ramps, gears, levers, swinging arms, and more. It's probably a lot more complicated than it needs to be, but it is hilarious to watch Rex press a button and send a cookie rocketing down a chute and eventually into his mouth. The ground is littered with cookie... Uh, detritus and failed runs, but Rex is proud anyway. It works perfect, he says, his mouth full. Thanks for the help. 
I didn't talk to Mars yet, did I? Mars is poring over a real book with real paper. You crowd around her and take a look at it. This belongs to that new kid, Nomi Nomi, Mars says. Litting her voice like a question. I told them I was looking for someone to draw designs for my new fashion line, and they just handed me this. The book is filled with character designs, giant romax, and pictures of characters kissing. It was so good, Mars says, turning pages. This is what we need here. People with talent. You pass a group of soldiers from the healer paws, leaving the garden. One of them eyes you with disdain, but the rest ignore you. Inside, Cal is scrawling as he's taking a planning event. His expression softens when he sees you, but not by much. Hey, Selene, he says. Did you see those jerks? They're always sniffing around here, trying to start a fight with me. I think their leader is that mouthy kid vase. He leans one arm on his rake. Whatever, joke's on them. Ain't gonna play their little soldier games. Tanjun is about to duck back into engineering when you approach. She winces and shields her eyes from the sun. She looks at you miserably and notices that her right eye is glowing faintly. It's my new hollow eye implant, uh, Tanj says. It's ghostly ghost snaps in and out of existence as she blinks. I seem to be experiencing some unpleasant side effects from it, similar to that of our ocular migraine, Tanj confesses. It's warned me that this level of visual information can be difficult for the human brain to comprehend at first. You agree to follow her into engineering and get out of the sun. It's similar to a hollow palm, she explains, holding her head and forehead and squinting, but with an indefinitely large screen because it projects into directly into Oculus. It used to belong to the Doctor Instance, but she passed it down for me to help with my work. I'm sure you'll get used to it soon. Maybe we should take it out. And she sets her jaw and nods, determined. I know I will, it's only pain. It's more than an implant, Tanj continues as you follow her in the med bill Hollow eyes are the very important part of human augmentation. They represent our next steps towards extending as a species. She touches the red scar where her hollow palm used to be. No more clunky screens, no more privacy concerns, she says. Elegant, integrated design. It deserves the motion of my hands and uses it to generate an AR interface for my entire field of vision. It's partially powered by my own metabolism. Though the magnets are embedded in my skull, it's beautiful. Nobody else is here, you hear the gentle hum of experiments running in the corner. This kind of technology is so far beyond what we're capable of reproducing in the colony. A tanned size rubbing her temple under the implant. Once they're gone, they're gone. Maybe Earth will send us a shipment of new ones someday, but I expect that they've developed something more advanced since we left Earth. I suppose it's more likely they've forgotten about us completely. Ring, ring. The quiet hum of the laboratory is shattered by an alarm. Tanch jumps in sudden noise and shuts her eyes tight. I have to get this, she mutters, gesturing in the air of silence the ringing. The simulation I'm running is time sensitive, she explains. Specimens require minute changes to their environment every two hours. That was minute, not minute. Uh, temperatures, humidity, light noise. She grimaces. If we had a better annotation, this wouldn't be a problem. I could do it. Tangent considers this. Yes, yes, you've proven yourself trustworthy in lab, she says. It's experiment 2A on the wall there. She slumps down at the floor beside you, rests her arm there on. Rests her head on her arms. Go tell me what you see, and I'll walk you through it. With Tangent's assistant, you see the environmental parameters of your experiment, which seems to involve fungal growths of some kinds. It's unfamiliar to you, but you're able to follow with Tangent's instructions easily. While you're looking over some of the specimens, you realize you can make improvements to Tangent's modeling. You make the changes and log them diligently in the computer. Tanj reads the sigh of relief when you turn, unaware of your meddling for now. That should buy me two more hours. Tanj shifts over, wordlessly inviting you to sit down beside her. Her arm is cool to the touch that rests against your. Tanj turns to you. Thank you for your assistance. Hey, finally a flirt option with her that isn't insulting to her. Tanj gives you a slight smile, barely visible from Plate Glow or Halai. People always tell me I should take care, better care of myself, she says. And they're right, because when other people try to take care of me, they usually get it wrong. Only I know what I need. But you helped, Tanj said. Thank you. Please don't tell Instance that my body is adjusting poorly to Halai. It's only temporary. This stupid flush prison is not allowed to draw the limits of my form. The new boy from the Healer's Fair is a couple years older than you. He's very handsome, and the missing arm gives him a heroic battle-scarred vibe. 
He stands tall and ready for action even though he's it's a normal boring day. The other recruits milling around the garrison give him a wide respectful berth. He sees you staring and gives you a curt nod. My name is Vase, Lieutenant Alvasius, he says, considering you with a glint of challenge in his eyes. And you are? How do you introduce yourself? I'm just a kid. I practically run this place. I'm a soldier like you. I'm into science. I'm an explorer. I'm a hard worker. And I just want to have some fun before I die. I'm clearly into science. His expression doesn't change. Is that right, he says, with the air of a boy who's hard to impress. Nice to meet you, Selene. I hear it's been a rough couple years for the colony. Lucky thing our healer paws came along just in time. He continues. Don't worry, we have some of the best soldiers. The very best. We'll keep the colony safe. Are you one of the best soldiers? We train as a team, Vase says, and clears his throat. Yes, I've won more than my fair share of zero-g judo matches in virtual rifle tournaments, even competing against the adults. You act impressed and make some embarrassing clear signals that you find him attractive. Well, he says, nodding like he understands. Aren't you intriguing? Maybe we'll see more of each other in some self-defense classes. You're running late for humanities class. When you arrive, everyone is gathered in the beanbags around the groom's big hollow projector. The ship's computer conjurance is displayed on it. She's giving today's lesson, reading an old book of Earth poetry. Sit back down next to Tange and nudge her and motion up. What's this? Tange frowns at you. Where have you been? She whispers. Ever since Professor Haldai, Conjurus has been teaching in this class. She then frowns at everything in general. He said everyone else who might be qualified is too busy. And no, they didn't ask me. What does a computer know about poetry? You wrinkle your nose. Biology and physics, sure. You tell Tangent. Writing is about expression and understanding the subtleties of human communication. Suddenly, Conjurus's mother swings over to you and recites... Oh, have you all the beauty you threw no. That you, so vain, lest pride might serve if it even were true. And you might gain, by humbler show of graces you possess, the haughty rearing makes the charm less. Chandra's eyes go wide and the glass, glass kickles at you. You're pretty sure you just got a clap back from a robot, but you can't be sure. Congruence asks you to take a stack of blank papers and a box of pencils from the classroom nanoprinter and pass them out in class. Today we will be practicing our handwriting, she announces. You hear Tantric groan beside you. But Congruence, she whines, how would you ever need to write by hand when we have hollow palms? This exercise will be part history lesson, part future skill, Congruence tells the class. In the future, you may not always have access to the hollow palm called technology. Our replicators and computers will break down eventually, and when they do, you will have to rely on low-tech solutions to everyday tasks. So first lesson, how to correctly hold a pencil. You and the other students get to work learning how to print by hand. And it's a little bit like holding a stylus, but the texture's all wrong. The letters are small and cramped. You have trouble keeping them in a straight line. Tans, though, is suffering the worst. Ha, huh, Mars laughs. Look, look, we finally found something Tans isn't good at. Look, she keeps missing up her lowercase a's and e's. Tans is usually using a stylus with her hollow palm. She's never actually drawn letters. She fumbles like a child bashing her fists against a hollow palm for the first time. It's painful to watch. You can tell she's getting more frustrated with each letter. Mars, on the other hand, has lovely penmanship. She can even write in cursive. My papa taught me when he was little. Or when I was little. She says, showing off her paper. Cultured people know how to write for real. I'll help you, Tangent. Aw, oh, I lost some friendship. I don't need your help, Tang. Sears. She hates being bad at something, but being patronized is even worse. So let me do it myself, she grumbles, balling up her fifth piece of paper on the floor. Mars laughs, but after a few minutes of tense silence, she looks after Tanja's work. You're pressing too hard, Mars tells her softly. Loosen your grift. It's different from typing in the air with stylus. Try moving your shoulder instead of wrist and fingers. Tanja takes a deep breath and ties again. Slow and deliberate, Mars nods and slides it closer, putting her hand over Tanja's and guiding her pencil on paper. There you see, you're getting it, she murmurs. Tanja's pinks. her cheeks go pink. After a minute, Tanja eases her tension and her writing starts to flow more naturally. Ah, oh, thanks. She stammers, pushing her chair back away from Mars. You hear a scuttling of metallic legs. What the heck? 
and a strange knee high robot bursts into your engineering lab, going full tilt on its six or eight legs. It slams into the wall hard enough to lock itself down. It seems to have trouble getting back up, and it's flailing its metal legs around dangerously. Fix the robot! Oh, Selene, thank you, Kagurn says, wheeling in on a horror portable screen. I was running diagnostics on the little fellow when it broke away and made a run for it. I really need somebody in my hands here. Or to be my hands here. She continues. Everything used to be easier with Hal around. I miss him. The girls doesn't need to be doesn't need to clear her throat, but when you get to the six pressure, she's simulating it anyway. If you want to come help me in the robotics lab, just come down any time. Ooh. Robotics lab. That sounds fun. You're honestly pumped for your first day in robotics lab. There wasn't enough room on Strato for a proper lab, so most of your life you've been warned that the bots in the colony relies on, like the watering pots in the hoverless, will eventually break down for good. With a fully functioning robotics lab, you should be able to keep those bots active for a lot longer. Plus, there's all sorts of unused bots in here. You look around and wonder at the wide array of Cassies and Cell, maybe one day you'll be able to create new robots of your own. You can't wait to show off what you can do. Endurance is so relieved to have an assistance. Since Hal died, well, Dr. Instance is too busy to help, she says as you're setting up. Tangent sometimes lends a hand, literally, but she seems to be more interested in her own projects. Chief Engineer seems to think that there's a lost cause that we should just recycle them, here some pines. Hal would never have thought they were trash, so you're excited to work on Selene. Good to know. I'll try to make a fair to hug Rex each uh, season, so we can just befriend him and leave him open as an option. It's like to fix things, program is super cool. I want to build something massive. You know what? Given that dying tentacle monster, let's see if we can build a massive mech to take on the next monster. Maybe you can make me a body one day, Gertz jokes. I want it always to be 10 feet tall. You know what? Gertz mech to take on monsters sounds like a good long term plan. Gertz goes quiet and then adds Go ahead and look around. If you have any questions, let me know. You spend the day getting to know your way around the Mars lab, meeting all the bots you're going to be working with. It's broken, forgotten bots, just need a little TLC. The Virtumelia Festival is a welcome day of normalcy in an otherwise chaotic year. Despite some lingering rivalry between the two factions, Virtumelia is the chance for the Helios and Stratos to come together and appreciate the bounty of the planet. At least that's what they don't say! As Governor Loom takes on the stage to address the colony, you can't help but notice the crowd just has segregated itself according to the Ship of Origin. Rex shoots you away from the other, uh, from the Strato side, and Nomi's making a silly face. The ace is surrounded by the other young soldiers, all looking sharp in their Heliopaz uniforms. With Tangent standing beside you, you wonder if the two ships will ever feel like one colony. A fanfare plays over the square's announcement system. Lum's honor guard do a complex drill with their drone rifles. Greetings, people of Virtuma, Lum says, his voice ringing on his right. Oh, yeah. We may be far from our beautiful Earth, but we can still celebrate and be thankful for what we have here. We worked hard to save this big little, little colony from this brink of destruction, and you should be proud of our work. Helios, chair, your side square is more quiet. I know some of you have been asking, Loom, how are you going to do it all by yourself? How are you going to be run the colony, solve everyone's problem, turn this planet into a paradise, and look this good? Loom strikes a pose to his pattern of plight pause. Well, I have the answer for you, he continues. The old council made a lot of bad choices, like illegally leaving Earth, but I believe in second chances, so I've appointed the original department heads on my own council, Loom's Council 2.0. Better not disappoint me. He laughs and makes fingers guns at the department heads and put up on stand your toes, Stratos. I also want to promise everyone here today that we're going to make Vertuma safe for humans, Lum says. And the next time those bastard Xenos attack, we're going to blow them so many little pieces that there won't be enough left to wipe off our boots. We've already got the defenses, he says, gesturing broadly to the new taller, thicker walls. And we're building homes for everyone. Homes where people can raise children again, knowing that our military men and women are keeping us safe. Big cheers from both sides this time. Some of the colonists around you even have tears in their eyes, especially those who lost family in the last attack. Loom goes on for a while, lionizing the healing of Paz's military strength and casting several digs at your failed colony spurs. Finally, the crowd disperses to set up a square for her afternoon festivities, some traditional and some new. At the tables, Aunt Anne and kids are setting up from the start of dinner. 
There's an unimaginable amount of food thanks to the heal of the processed food rations versus, and piles upon piles of xeno meat from the hunting parties and those who can stomach it. Anne is all smiles, carefully making effort to move on as Loom mandated despite still mourning her lost song poem. But not even the festive atmosphere can force smiles onto Anemone's face. Let's just go with come on, it's party time. I figured it wouldn't make her happy. That's fine. You encourage Anemone not to dwell on the past. Things are looking up. Now's the time to bond with our new colonists and pave the way to the bright future. Anemone just stares the terrain and stew in the arms. She sits down, wipes her eyes, and walks away. Oh, these changed. The chime sounds in to announce that the square is set up for the annual competitions. What do you choose this year? I guess I'm not going to be a, what, six-time science fair champ? Guess I'm going to be a trivia champ instead. Instance is too busy to organize the science fair, so you have a Helio tradition set. Trivia night, hosted by Concurrence. You, Tangent, and Nomi all sign up. We miss the science fair, Tangent grumbles. But I've been memorizing facts to prepare. Yeah, you won't come in second place again, Tangent. You get most of the questions right. All that study and watching Holovids definitely paid off. Nomi shrugs off their loss. Tang, or Tang, tries to, but you can tell she's actually kind of ticked off she didn't win. You should be used to it by now. You always lose to me. After the facilities, the mood in the colony is a lot lighter. You see people smiling easier and see mixed groups of Helios and Stratus socializing together. It feels like the first time people have actually let themselves relax. You're headed off on a lunch break when you see Mars and Tanj sitting together in the engineering break room. Tanj is eating a sandwich while also scrolling on her hollow palm with it. And Mars is half collapsed on the table, barely holding her head up on her hand as she pouts at Tan, or Tanj. Come on, she whines. You said we we're going to hang out after lunch. Aren't you done eating yet? Tanj takes a slow, deliberate bite of her sandwich and chews while making eye contact with Mars. It goes from funny to awkward to hilarious as Mars' face falls and she puts her head on the table and groans. Proper mastication is important for digestive health. Tanj answers primarily a smile curling around the corner of her mouth. You can masticate in private, Mars mutters. What are you reading, and how is it more important than me, your best and only friend on the planet? Just something for work, Tanja answers. It's really interesting. I don't know how Dr. Instance was so well published. I didn't even though she was only 25 when the Strato left Earth. She was practically a prodigy, like me. She looks at her hollow screen. It's absolutely fascinating. We're so lucky to have such an accomplished researcher here on Vertuma. Read over the shoulder. You take a seat at the table and sneak a look at uh, Tanja's screen. Gets a few words. Recombinizing, tetrotropism, RNA, protein sheaths, intrinsic immunity, maybe something to do with viruses, or the picture is possibly also a fungi. Without further ex examination, it's hard to tell. Tanja notices you and looking and shuts off her holoprom, shooting you a cool look. Is it something to do with shimmer sickness? Mars wonders out loud. Wait, I want to learn about microphages. Tanj looks startled, but please. She turns her hollow palm back on until she, so you can read along. It's dense, but interesting, and definitely about the viruses that affect fungi. I didn't know you were so interested in this is older work as well, Selene. Tang, or Tanj says. Perhaps we could work together to parse this section next. It's particularly challenging. OMG, nerds! Mars laughs. Look at you two eggheads. Better you than me. Tanj graces you with a small, thankful smile. You've been eating for like a half hour, Tan or Tanj. Come on, Mars says, pulling your hands down her face. Please, can we do something fun for some rampaging Xeno eats us? We're both too pretty to die of boredom. Tanj smiles. Think I'm pretty, Mars, she asks, seeming genuinely curious. Mars sets her hand on top of Tanj's. The prettiest, she swears her other hand over her heart. Even prettier than me. Well, I mean, I went in the looks department, but I think smart women get, like, extra points. Hmm, Tanj says, puts her hand on top of Mars' hand, and leaning in to fix Mars with an unusually fertilitious expression. Yes, do tell me all about my great beauty, she deadpans. That's all I live for. Mars laughs and tosses her hair over her shoulder, and you tune them out in favor of eating your lunch before you're expected back in engineering.
You overhear your dad talking to one of the other cultivators. He seems to be upset about something to do with the new governor and people from Heliopause. When the other woman leaves, you have a chance to talk to some of the burning questions you've had. Who are these new people? Is Governor Loom some kind of space cop? Why do the Helios know about Mom? How come you just let them take over? Nah, no burning questions here. Well, let's ask about Mom. Your dad looks startled and tries to muster a friendly smile. Uh, you overheard us, kiddo? Listen, Celine. He hesitates and looks around nervously as if afraid of being watched. You're just going to have to trust us adults on this one. There are things you're still too young to understand. I'm not too young. I thought the same thing about myself once, your dad said gravely. I was wrong. The Helios came here just like us, looking for a better life. Some of them had other reasons too, but now they're here and we have to learn to work together. When your mother and I were young on Earth, we learned a hard lesson. He gives a grim smile. We learned a lot of hard lessons. One was that it was safer to be led by one dangerous person than be attacked by an army of them. He let that sink in. Another was that sometimes when adults tell you not to worry, you should listen to them. Mohan, enjoy your youth. He gestures towards the Heliopause. Go get to know some of the new kids. I'm sure you'll though I'm sure you'll find they're a lot like you. Before you can say another word, your dad is called back to work. There's still so much to be done to rebuild the farms and geoponic greenhouses, and you can see the people from the Helio helping him. Maybe they aren't all that bad. <laughs> the Heliopause didn't have an onboard AI on like Congruous, which must have been hard. She runs the robotics lab just like she runs all the rest of the colony systems, silently and perfectly. Working with her is like working with the all-knowing, all-powerful god who doesn't mind doing all the chores. You always knew Congruence was more advanced than all the other bots put together, but you didn't realize that the assumption was literal. She programs all the bots based off her own code, so it's almost like they're all part of her. Sometimes while you're working your bot, she'll joke that it tickles. As Congruence's hands, you do the physical maintenance on the bots. The ones that you see most often are the vacuum bots. As the colony has gotten larger and much, much dirtier, they're more likely to get clogged and break down. Then people have to do more cleaning by hand, which makes them complain to command, which means more maintenance requests on your desk. One vacuum bot in particular is just eccentric. It's broken in a way that you can't really permanently fix it, but you keep patching it up and sending it back out to serve the colony. You see it in the lab so often you decide to name it. Rosie, Robbie, Roomba, Rob, something else. I think we'll just go with the Nintendo reference. You stencil the bot's name on its way, on its Cassie, and send it some way. There you go, little Rob. See you in a few days. Late dust into early wet. Uh, Tanj flags you down in the hallway. Oh, Selene, do you have a moment? You go out on expedition sometimes, she asks. At least far more than I do, or ever would wish to, so would you mind doing me a favor? Oh, we have not had great luck with expeditions to go out that far. But, sure. We could do, of course, depends what it is, I'm not your errand runner. You can probably just go with, uh, of course. It's a small thing, really, and I'm to understand it's not terribly dangerous either, uh, Tanj replies. I simply need you to bring me some hot pie eggs uh, the next time you come across us out there. Oh, that's this, but well, she makes an evocative demissive gesture. Why? I'll keep an eye out for them. I'm not your runner. Uh, just go with, I'll keep an eye out for them. That's all I ask, Tanj replies primarily. It's quite common if the reports from foragers are to be believed. They tell me they're commonly find nests in the Valley of Vertigo. It's positively lousy with them. Get to work. Security Chief Rat has brought in some sentry turrets for repair. The damn things are jammed again, he exclaims, exasperated. They turn on, but instead of firing, they just make this loud buzzing noise. He flicks the turret on. The room is filled with a high-pitched clunking squeal. You wince and cover your ears. It's annoying, but not very effective, he shouts over the din. Can you make these things kill again with bullets, not with noise? Uh, I can. Need engineering 40 or greater. Seems like the thing to do. Working on the turrets is a bit of trial and error, but you figure it out. You fix the jam one, grease the rest, and adjust their programming so they don't shoot quite so fast. After a few years out in the elements, they're getting some wear and tear, and old machines need to be operated more delicate. You suggest re requisition some crews to build shelters for the turrets. Rhett is impressed by your handiwork and transfers you a few extra kudos.
There's some more robots. You're tasked with fixing a med bed, which is probably the most complicated piece of hardware in the colony that's not congruence. They work in mysterious ways. Even Ch Chief Engineer Instance doesn't fully understand the healing fields they use to quickly repair bones and tissue and correct cellular anomalies. It's old tech from Earth, and the pressure to keep it running is immense. And we should be hitting a new season now. Glow! Nami Nami is assigned to work with you in robotics lab this month. At first you're happy for the help, but it quickly becomes clear that they're more interested in unreasonable fantasies like building giant robots to defend the colony. I still don't think that's unreasonable, I wanted to do it to congruence myself. It's not in an anime they chatter as you show them, or you show them how to ground themselves before working in sensitive electronics. It's totally cool, we just have to. Perhaps it's better to master the basics first, nomination, congruence pitches in smoothly. For example, there's a vacuum bot awaiting repairs to its intake and output valves. You know without looking, it's Rob. Yep, your problematic little buddy sitting in his first bay. You pull up to the work requisition on your hollow palm. Looks like there's reports it's been spewing dirt out instead of vacuuming it up. Typical. Not to worry, little buddy, Nami says excitedly. We'll fix you right up and get you on your way again. They peer into its sensors. Maybe, with a few upgrades, if it's blowing dirt out, maybe it doesn't want to be a vacuum bot anymore. They look at you, hopefully. We can make it a gardening bot? Let's just fix it. Tell me about this anime defense bot. Oh, no, this one's broken. You know what? How about we turn this one into a gardening bot? That sounds like fun. The domestic bots were designed to be adaptable, with modular parts that can be swapped between units if they're needed to be for other purposes, or combined with ones that break down beyond repair. Nami's right. Maybe it doesn't want to be a vacuum bot anymore. Yup, Nami fit it with a water tank instead of a vacuum bag, and get concurrence to swap its software for a gardening module. Now, he'll be able to do basic chores around the greenhouses. Nami watches the bot toddle off with an inscrutable expression. That was a happy ending, they proclaimed, twirling a lock of their pink hair around in their finger. It's nice that even a bot can try a few things before figuring out what it wants to be when it grows up. There we go. You're relaxing in your quarters when you're with your dad when you hear the colony siren. The enemy is here, as expected. Your dad looks up from his novel. Huh, seems early this year. We should head to the shelter in the lounge. Uh, you've been drilling on new evacuation procedures for the past month. There's no need to be a hero now. There's so many new soldiers from the Helio. It's probably best if you just follow instructions and head to the lounge with your dad. Alrighty, we'll go to the front lines. Got the option this year. Got some bravery thanks to the plus 15. So... We'll go see how things are going. You muster with the rest of the defense force of the Grace. Brett and Loom are arguing about which tactics to employ. Loom tries to, or keeps trying to rally the soldiers with a heartening speech about giving it everything they've got. All the drones, all the explosives, and Russ keeps cutting in. We don't need to take any big risks, Resinsis. It's a smaller attack than we, and we have more than enough plasma rifles turrets. We should save our other resources for when we do need them. Why well, do things halfway, Looms Gate? We need to get in there and kick their asses back to goo, the goo they came from. We need to show people that we have everything under control for morale. Brett tries one more time to wrest control from forces back from Loom, but Loom's come up. Fire the explosive rounds, he orders. Aim the charges. Shells scream through the uh, permanent night, followed by the explosives, and you feel vibrating up to your boots. The Helios are on phase, but you and the other Strato guards exchange nervous looks. You hear yelling and then another boom as secondary explosives detonate. The bang of bloodthirsty animals reaches your ears, and then... Loom holds his finger to his ears. Great work! Just the stragglers in coming. Open the gates! You face off against the lesser Zeno, some kind of fiend semi-aquatic thing that's already half-dead and lipping dodgily through the gates. It's almost comical how easy it is to stun and kill it. By the time you're done, the other soldiers have dispatched the rest of their creatures. Smoke drifts in from the battlefield, from the explosions, and Astrid's scent of triumph. After the attack, Loom gathers everyone in the lounge and holds a big celebration for the soldiers. There's feasting and drinking and songs of valor as the party goes on long into the night. Some drift away in pairs, or more. Mars and Rex keep the dance going, and even Anamani seems relaxed, especially when the other cadets invite her to drink with them. Cal and Tammy sit together and talk all night, giggling about something and going quiet when anyone comes near. Tonight, everyone seems convinced that this victory means the colony will be safe forever. 
Maybe it will be. You sure want to believe it, too. There's no possible way the next goal is going to have something even worse. 